You know, the scripture says to give honor to whom honor is due, right? If you have your Bibles, and I trust that you do, turn with me to the book of Acts, uh, the book of Acts chapter 4. Uh, in preparing the sermon this week, I used the New Living Translation, which many of you use, and uh, those are the Bibles that are being distributed to you. But I also used the King James Version. Uh, when I first got saved, that's the Bible that was given to me. And I've memorized a lot of scripture, and they're all from the King James. So in all my messages, you're, you're always going to hear scripture from me. Uh, but the scriptures that I quote to you will be from the King James. So uh, the Lord is good. By the way, I still write out my sermons. I'm really old school. I write them out, and you know what? I use up a lot of the eraser on the top, you know? <laughs> oh, praise God. I've titled the message, Filled Again. It's right from the scriptures. It's based on verse 31, where the disciples were filled again with the Holy Spirit. This is months after Pentecost. Filled again. Uh, Acts was written by Luke as a sequel to the gospel uh, of Luke. The book of Acts is like a bridge from the gospels to the epistles. The, the book of Acts acts like a bridge for that. It's a theological book with biblical principles. By the way, there are biblical principles on every page of scripture that we can utilize. And the end of all interpretation is application. We're not just reading the Bible for stimulation or intellectual understanding and knowledge. No, we're listening and reading the Bible that by the grace of God we can apply the Bible. So we're not only hearers but doers of the word. And the key verse in the book of Acts is chapter 1 and verse 8, where our Lord says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And we are all witnesses. And Jesus gives us a template there in verse 8. He says, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world. And Jerusalem is like our hometown. It's our neighborhood. That's what it represents. As the disciples were in Jerusalem, so Jerusalem basically represents our neighborhood and, and our town where we live in. And then Judea is almost like Camden County or the state of New Jersey. So the disciples were told and encouraged by Jesus, hey, begin your witnessing in your hometown, in your home neighborhood. By the way, I've always felt my Christianity began right under my own roof. Can someone say amen? amen? Sure. So it begins under my roof. It begins in my neighborhood. It spreads to Judea, which is Camden County, the state of New Jersey, and then it goes to Samaria. Samaria pretty much represents what? Our whole nation. And then into the uttermost parts of the world. So it begins home and it spreads. And that's what's happened with the gospel message. Thank God for the missionaries that have gone and preached the gospel. And by the way, we are all missionaries in that sense. We all have a mandate. And I think our greatest witness sometimes is our lifestyle. It's our testimony. You know, it's like the guy in, in John 9 who was blind. He said, I really don't have all the answers. I don't know what happened, but once I was blind, but now I see. And how can someone argue with your testimony? Hey, Jesus changed my life. Are you with me? So forget about the argument. It's our lifestyle. Thank God for that. A transformed life will convince people of Christ's love and his power. A transformed life will convince people of Christ's power and his love. The early church also became an extension of the ministry of Christ. What Jesus was doing in the Gospels, the disciples continued to do that. In the last chapter, when, when Joe mentioned, when they went, when they went to the temple, there was the, the man that was born uh, crippled. And Peter and John says, look, silver and gold have we none, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Listen, they knew what they had. They had the power of God. And you know what? We can tap into the power of God. The grace of God can use us to share the gospel with others, to be God's hand extended, to be his eyes and his feet 
and, and his love. And that's what we are to do. Let's, let's get into the message. In verses 1 through 11, we see Christ's first, uh, we see, excuse me, the first persecution of the early church. The Jewish leaders, they had Peter and John arrested for preaching the gospel. By the way, in those first couple verses, there are 11 people and groups who persecuted the disciples. You know, it's one thing in your block where you get a family that's persecuting you. I mean, could you imagine 11 people or groups that are persecuting you? This is exactly what happened. And you know what? By the grace of God, they continued to preach the gospel. It is absolutely amazing that they were able to withstand the persecution. Now, the Jewish council had 70 members, plus the high priest who, provided, who presided over the group. By the way, this is the same group that we're reading about in Acts chapter 4 that condemned Jesus just two months prior to that in Luke chapter 22. And the rulers asked, hey, what happened? What caused this man's healing in Acts 3? And Peter, with, filled with the Holy Ghost, he said, it's not us. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Friends, we always give God the glory, not us. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name receive glory and honor. By the way, that's Psalm 115, verses 1. We always give God the glory. And by the way, do you realize persecution grows the church? It always grows the church. I want to tell you, sometimes prosperity can cause us to be complacent. Can someone say amen? amen? I want to tell you, you know what I found? When the fire is heated a little bit, it draws you to your knees. When you're living on the mountaintop, on the beach, and everything's okay, oh, I'm going to stay on the beach, forget about church. You know, persecution draws us closer to the Lord, and it should. It should motivate us. You know, one of my hobbies is I grow fig trees. There was one time I had 12 different varieties of trees. But I want to tell you, a neighbor of mine has three huge, huge trees. And twice, her daughter went out there and didn't like the fig trees. She chopped them down. And you know what happened? They grew even bigger. Woo! <laughs> I love that. That's what happens with persecution. It may hurt a little bit. It may sting, but it draws us closer to the Lord. It makes us healthier. <laughs> and by the way, in Acts 2, we see that there were 3,000 believers. Here in Acts 4, there was 5,000 men. So the church grew and grew. Opposition and persecution doesn't curb the growth of the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The government can't stop the church. The tribe can't stop. No one can stop the growth of the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. You remember years ago, the, uh, the bamboo curtain, China tried to stop Christianity. It was or it's still outlawed to own a Bible. It's still outlawed to have church. And years later, when we were able to peek through the bamboo curtain, there's over 100 million Christians in China. Because the Lord said he was going to build his church. Nobody can stop the church. Don't you love that? We're on the winning team. Hallelujah. By the way, didn't you appreciate the worship team today? Praise God. The Lord is good, isn't he? No one can stop the church. <clears throat> By the way, in China, there is at least uh, the former vice president, Pence, he visited there. He said there were over 130 million Christians in China, born-again Christians. I think they may have more Christians here than we have in our country. To God be the glory. <laughs> in verses 8 through 22, let's move on. Peter boldly preaches to the Jewish leaders. The Sadducees, they were the influential people of that day. Listen, you know who they were? They were like the Supreme Court of that day. But Peter is not intimidated. He's going to preach the gospel. He's confident. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, supernatural boldness. And listen to what Peter does. He quotes from Psalm 118, verse 2 in the New Living Translation, which many of you have. It says, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. 
the Jewish leaders built their house without the cornerstone. Who is the cornerstone? It's Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. Praise God. Jesus is not only the cornerstone, he's our savior. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. He's our counselor. He's the lover of our soul. He's our peace. He's our joy. He's our comfort. He's our mighty God. He's our soon coming king. Jesus is our all in all. Hallelujah. Friends, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same yesterday. He died for us. He's the same today. He lives for us. He's the same tomorrow. He's coming back for us. Notice in verse 12, this is very important, friends, that we spend a couple minutes here. Peter says something monumental, doctrinally significant and profound. In the New Living Translation, which many of you have, there is salvation in no one else but Christ. Did you get that? Not the pastor, not the church, not the denomination, it's in Jesus. Only Jesus can save. This is very exclusive. It really is. There's many ways to Jesus, a million and one ways for someone to point you to Jesus, but there's only one way to God the Father, and that's through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And John 1, 12, but as many as received him, him. I know some people get offended at that, that it's only Jesus. Oh, well, it's other things. According to the word of God, only Jesus saves. And we constantly have to point people to Christ. Christ is our only means of salvation. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power of God. John 1, 12. We have to personally embrace Christ. Nothing, oh, I go to church. Great. You're wonderful. It's Christ that saves. Titus 3, 5 says, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. Titus 3, 5. But according to his mercy, he had saved us. Can I repeat that? It's not by works of righteousness. You know what that means? Well, I buy Girl Scout cookies. Uh, I, give, I give in the offering at the church. That's, that's great. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he had saved us. Friends, we are not saved by the sacrifices we make, but by the sacrifice Christ made for us. Can I repeat that? We're not saved. By the sacrifices that we make, we are saved by the sacrifice Christ made for us on the cross. Sometimes we think in heaven there's big scales with our names on it. And if our good deeds maybe just outweigh our bad deeds, then God will accept us. That makes a lot of sense, but it's not true. Friends, there is nothing we can do to merit salvation. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us. It's not our good deeds. It's not our good works. We buy Girl Scout cookies. That's great, but it can't save you. Only Jesus can save. One of the verses of Scripture that as Christians we should know when we're dealing with people and family and friends is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I'm going to share it with you in the King James. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, not something that you do or give that you'll be accepted. We are accepted by the grace of God. Listen, friends, God's initiative is grace. That's his initiative to us. He gives us grace. Our response is faith. When the two meet together, you have salvation. We can't be saved apart from God. We can't know God apart from God. So his initiative to us is grace. The grace of God. But we have to respond in faith. So it's not our faith in just something out there. It's our faith in Jesus. When the two meet together, that's what salvation is all about. And friends, Peter is telling the Jews, listen, who were religious. You know, sometimes our Jewish friends, when we tell them about Jesus, they get offended. They said, we have religion. Go tell someone else. 
according to the word of God. We need Jesus. Are you with me? Listen, this isn't Tony. This is the word of God. And sometimes people get upset at us. They're not ups upset at us. They're upset at the word of God. So there is no salvation apart from Jesus. And everybody said, let's, let's move on. The Jewish leaders were amazed at the influence and power of the disciples. Verse 13, they acknowledged they did not have any rabbinical training, but they had been with Jesus. Don't you love that? They had been with Jesus. The best criteria of all is to be with Jesus. But you know what? Closeness is likeness. Can I repeat that? The closer you are to Jesus, the more you're going to manifest Christian attributes. Did you get that? Closeness is likeness. You know, years ago when we used to spend time with our bad friends, we became like them, right? What is it, the adage, birds that flock together? Stay, you know? So the closer we are. Friends, what am I saying? A transformed life will convince people of Christ's love and his power. Friends, our greatest apologetics. Apologetics is the word that we use. How do we defend the gospel? You know, what means are we going to use? How do we defend the gospel when people approach us and ask us, well, yeah, you're a Christian. What do you mean by Christian? Our greatest apologetics is our lifestyle. Are you with me? People can't argue with that. You know what I feel? In order to win somebody to Jesus, you need to win them to yourself. You need to love and embrace them. Not just criticize them and judge them, but to embrace them. Are you with me? Before you win somebody to Jesus, win them to yourself. And our greatest apologetics is our, is our lifestyle. The healed man, by the way, uh, Joe mentioned the healed man, uh, 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 the man that was healed in chapter 3. He joined the disciples. He's proof of the power of God. His healing substantiated the gospel. The evidence is overwhelming. It's irrefutable. The Jews couldn't deny the man was healed. You know, we're going to have communion today. I'm going to pray that the Lord will touch us today. Bring healing to us today. In verses 15 through 22, Peter and John were threatened. I mean, these guys were nasty. They threatened them. And you know what Peter said? <laughs> we got to obey God rather than man. We're not going to obey you. You know, there's a scripture in Corinthians. It says, one plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. I want to tell you, you know what my job is, your job is? We plant seeds. I can't save anybody. You know, sometimes as a pastor, oh, yeah, 10 people got saved at the church. I, we understand that. I can't save anybody, neither can you. Only the Lord can save. But we plant seeds. The Bible says one plants, another waters. God gives the increase. So when God gives the increase, we say, Lord, it's you. Are you with me? So, friends, when we witness to people, we plant seeds. And you know what? As we plant them, God is faithful, right? He waters the seed. He gives the increase. You know, my grandson is a school teacher at Haddonfield. He's also the basketball coach, the JV basketball coach. And he actually owns his, his own business. But Monday, we had him over for dinner. And he was telling me, Pop, he said, I've been witnessing to a friend for over six months. I've been inviting him. And for six months, he's been telling me, no, 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 no. He said, but guess what? Last Sunday, I invited him, and he came to church. So you plant seeds. By the way, my grandson is here today. Stand up, Anthony. Come on. <laughs> And how about us? How about us? Greet the people and share a scripture, maybe. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. I love this guy, man. <laughs> oh, praise God. Okay, let, let's move on. In verses 22 through 32, the disciples prayed for more boldness, and their prayer was answered. The New Living Translation, the whole house shook. The house physically shook. They filled again. Subsequent to Pentecost. By the way, the we, we, we have to be careful we don't miss the theme here. The central theme of their preaching was the resurrection of Jesus. Friends, I want to remind you, Jesus rose, rose physically. He rose literally. He rose bodily. He rose triumphantly. Muhammad is in the grave. Buddha is in the grave. Confucius is in the grave. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. He triumphed over death and the grave, and he gave us life, joyful life, eternal life. Thank God he's no longer on the cross. So often he's depicted on the cross. He's no longer on the cross. Amen. He came to impart hope and joy and peace. Notice in verse 33, I'm going to use the King James here. The disciples received from Jesus great power and great grace. You know, I'm going to use the word mega power. We're familiar with mega, right? Mega power. What is the power that the Lord gives us? The power to be what he wants us to be and the power to do what he wants us to do. Can I repeat that? I mean, what is this power? It's the power to be what God wants us to be, and the power to do what God wants us to do. Did you get a witness on that? Sure, that's the power that he sent. And also, mega grace. Grace is commensurate for our need. The greater the grace, the, the greater the need, the greater the grace. And our goal is to plug into that power. It's available to us. It's available to us. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Are you with me? He's the vine. We are the branches. The greater our attachment to Jesus, the greater will be our fruitfulness. We need to stay attached. Let me move on. In verses 32 and verses 34 through 37, we see the benevolent program of the early church. By the way, there was tremendous unity. There was tremendous camaraderie in the early church. The job market for Jewish workers were limited, and there were some who were very poor, very needy. And some of the people in the church, they sold their possessions, and they established a benevolent program for the needy. For the needy. And once they did that, the disciples distributed the resources to the needy. Let me share a couple thoughts on, on this. Number one, this is not Christian communism. Can I repeat that? This is, we're not being taught here, Christian communism, where they're going to reject capitalism and work and industry. Not at all. Also, giving was voluntary. There was no mandate. You had to do this. It was strictly voluntary. Thirdly, it was uh, uh, not a membership requirement to be part of the church. We're not told that. This practice is not a biblical principle for us to embrace, and it is not taught or practice in the epistles. Can I repeat that? This practice is not a biblical principle for us to embrace, and it is not taught or practiced in the epistles. Now, should we be benevolent? Yes. Should we be gracious when there is someone in need? Yes. A hundred times, yes. Should we be kind? Yes. Should we be God's hand extended? Yes, yes, a million times. I remember, you know, my wife, Gina, worked for the school district in Philly. She was the school operations officer. She used to handle the books, the paycheck and all. And I remember she used to come home so burdened. She worked in a, in a real poor neighborhood with the school. And she'd come home and say the kids, during winter, the kids wouldn't have any coats. Kids would have no socks, dirty clothes. She was so burdened, she did something about it. She organized a clothing drive for coats. She got a bunch of coats. And then after that, she, had, she was able to get gift bags with kids' clothing to give to the kids. Furthermore, she asked the principal if they can get a washer and dryer and put it in one of the rooms so the kids can come back with clean clothing. He said no, but she had the checkbook. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny. <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not good at comedian. So. <laughs> she asked the principal, and you know what they did? They got a grant. 
And they, what, did, what did you get? Washer, dryer, a bunch of things. She taught me one time, she gave a kid a, a bag. Kid didn't have any socks in the middle of winter. He, he stopped right there he was, where he was. He sat and he put on the socks because he was that cold. Should we be benevolent? Yes, a million times. A million times. Now, I want to tell you the flip side to this. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, it says if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, is Paul being judgmental? I don't think so. This is not an inability to work. It's an unwillingness to work. Paul is saying, listen, if you're able to go to work, you need to go to work to feed yourself and your family. Are you with me? I, I want to tell you, there were times I struggled as a pastor when dealing with benevolent requests. There were times I had a struggle. Like, wow, man, this, this, this guy's lazy. He doesn't want to go to work. How, how, how often do you want to pay somebody, you know? There's a balance. You know, what, you know what I love about Scripture? There is a balance. In the book of Proverbs, it says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. There is a balance. And while we need to help and we need to be a blessing and we need to do all that we can to help the poor and the needy, the balance is, hey, listen, go to work. And by the way, today, can anyone say, oh, I can't get a job? Every other store has a help on its sign. So we... And everybody said, let, you know what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16? He said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One of the great leaders and examples of the early church is Barnabas. They changed his name from Joe to Barnabas. You know why? Because he went around encouraging people. I love that. He edified people. Isn't that wonderful? What a great role model in the church that he went around and he encouraged, he encouraged everybody. And that goes along with your scripture, iron sharpens iron. You know what that's from? When you have a knife that's dull, you get a piece of steel and you rub it along to bring back the edge. Sometimes we come to church and, oh, boy, our edge is off. Thank God we have people like Ephraim that's going to come and hug you and say, I love you. Are you with me? Is he here? Where's he at? Is he camp? What's he doing? He's around here somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Are you with me? Can I, can I encourage you? Can I say something to you? Gene and I prayed for you this morning. We should pray in the morning before we come. Lord, bless the service. And Lord, maybe there's a brother. Maybe Maurice needs a word of encouragement. Maybe he just needs a hug. We're the body of Christ, right? Are you with me? We want to do everything we can to be a blessing, to be an encouragement to one another. Notice, let me pull it together. The disciples were filled again. There's one baptism in the Holy Spirit, but many refillings. Uh, you know, at conversion, we receive the person of the Holy Spirit. I hope we all understand that. In John chapter 20, verse 22, it says Jesus breathed on, on them, the Holy Spirit. They received the person of the Holy Spirit. Everybody who was saved, you may, you may have given your heart to the Lord this morning. You have the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. Romans 8, 16 says, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When you give your heart to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. Our spirit is dead. You know, we're born one-third dead. Our spirit man is dead. It's not alive. When God the Holy Spirit comes in, the light comes on. The reason that you're here today, I didn't call you to come. The Holy Spirit in you is active. Are you with me? He's making it alive. He's encouraging you. You read your Bible. Why? Because the spirit man is motivating you and inspiring you. Thank God for that. So when, now, obviously, when you give your heart to the Lord, we grow. You know, the Bible says grow in grace and in the knowledge. We're growing, and sometimes people grow faster than others. But when you give your heart to Christ, you get the, God, the Holy Spirit, living in your life. The baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, 
is something subsequent to that. After John 20, you remember Jesus said, go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. You remember that in Acts 2? And as they tarried, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in other tongues. The baptism with the evidence is a different experience. By the way, Pentecostalism is the fastest-grown religion in the world. A lot of people think it's, it's, it's the Muslims. It's not. And even in our, our movement, the Assemblies of God, there is a hundred, and, uh, excuse me, excuse me, 66 million people who are affiliated. What am I saying, friends? The Lord can fill us, and he can fill us again. Come on, friends. Sure. He loves us. He desires to fill us. You know what? Sometimes we get beat up in the world, don't we? Come on, let's be honest. We live in a secular society. Daily forces are trying to erode our faith. That's why it's so important to have daily devotions. My wife, we pray together in the morning. We pray for you guys. Thank God he fills us over and over again. Isn't that wonderful? I'm reminded of this young man. He used to come to the altar after Sunday morning, and he would cry out, Oh, Jesus, fill me. Jesus, fill me. And the Lord would meet him and fill him. Come Tuesday, shh, he lived like the devil the rest of the week, and he'd come back on Sunday. Jesus, fill me. Jesus, fill me. And sure enough, the Lord would fill him. Come Tuesday, he'd be living like the devil. And one Sunday, he's at the altar, and he's saying, Jesus, fill me. Jesus, fill me. And this dear woman in the back said, don't do it, Lord. He leaks. <laughs> we all leak. Yes, we First John 1, 8 was written to Christians. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But you know what, friends? The Lord is there to fill us. That's what I'm trying to say to us today. The Lord is there. He fills us over and over again. When we have problems, we run have difficulties. Man, we live in a secular society. We live in a sinful world. We're getting bombarded all the time. You can't even watch TV anymore. Some of the stuff. Are you with me? Thank God he fills us. Let's transition in, into communion today. Ushers, if, if you're going to pass out the communion. Uh, let, let me say this about communion. And this is me. I think communion is a very, very personal, solemn experience. Uh, can I say that again? It is a very, very solemn experience. Uh, While they're distributing the elements, just listen to me for a minute. Give it to Gina. Gina, if you could open up. I have a hard time opening this seat for him. You want to have me around and open it for me? <laughs> I want to tell you something that happened to me. And please, don't misinterpret what I'm going to say. Oh, thanks, babe. After Gina and I uh, retired, we went to a church, and the pastor was a friend of mine. Great, great church. They had three services. I, if I tell you the church, you're going to say, wow. And I want to tell you what happened. There was the worship. The youth pastor got up. Everybody had the cups. They gave them to you when you walked in the door. He got up and he said, All right, right after the announcement, we're going to take communion now. And he prayed a prayer and he said, okay, let's take the bread and the cup. Within two minutes, it was over. I don't think that's the way the early church celebrated communion. Two minutes. Are you with me? Please, someone say amen. amen. I, I just feel like it's a very, very personal. So, I want to tell you, the Lord could heal us this morning. Maybe you got some scars that someone has hurt you. I'm going to pray that the Lord will heal those scars today. He can do that in communion. You say, Tony, I got some emotional issues I'm going with. I want to tell you, the Lord could heal you today. In communion. Lord, please touch us today. 
bring healing to us today. Heal us today, Lord. Forgive us. Lord, maybe there's a root of bitterness deep down, something that someone did to us. Bring healing to that bitterness, Lord. Maybe it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Bring healing to us. Do something supernatural today in the communion, Lord. Let's take the bread. Jesus was broken that we could be made whole. I wonder if you have a physical need. Just slip up your hand. I want to pray. I'm standing. I'm raising my hand too. I have a physical need. Lord, your word says that by your stripes we are made whole. Your word says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you will deliver us out of them all. In the name of Jesus, release your power right now upon us. Release your power on us right now and make us whole. In the name of Jesus. 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 Oh, Lord, lay your nail-scarred hand upon us today. Bring healing to us today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake together. You know, friends, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28, it says, before we partake of communion and the cup which represents the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin, in verse 28 it says we ought to examine ourselves. You know what that means? We inspect. It's almost like we give ourselves an examination. Did you ever examine yourself? I remember a couple years ago, I was watching the porn stars with Rick. You know, that place in Las Vegas where people take their stuff. I like that show. This guy brought in over $100,000 worth of silver bars. And you know what Rick said? I'm, I'm going to buy them. But he said, I got to test it first. And he took the bars and he got a drill. And he drilled into it. And the shavings, he put some kind of a liquid some kind of a chemical to make sure that it was real silver. The word, the Greek word in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, that's exactly what it means. It means to test metal, to make sure the metal is pure. When we partake of communion, we examine ourselves. Has any, in, forgive us, has any impurities come in? We want to get it right. We don't want to leave here with that stuff. Communion gives us the opportunity to come clean. Communion gives us the opportunity to be, to be whole and to be forgiven. Why would we leave with impurities in our lives? Are you with me? A couple weeks ago, Pocono race car. One of the racers, Denny Hamlin, happened just two weeks ago. I was reading it on ESPN. He won the race. Big, big, big. The owner was there, the champagne. Now, what a big thing they did on the race course. Big to do. It was in first place. The next day, the officials examined this car. They put something extra on the car. And he was disqualified. Are you with me? During communion, we examine our lives. We examine our attitudes. Have they been Christ-like? We examine our motives. And we examine this thing in our mouths. Have I said anything? 
to hurt my spouse, to hurt anybody. It gives us an opportunity to come clean. Friend, I encourage us, don't leave without being forgiven and cleansed. That's what communion is for. It's not to condemn us, it's to heal us and to forgive us. We need to apologize and repent. We're in Father's house. Let's do it. Are you with me? Sure, let's do it. You know, 1 John was written to Christians. John says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from not sin, some sin, all sin. Oh, rabasata, rabasita. The Lord desires to cleanse us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know, friends, it's one thing when someone deceives us. It's another thing when we deceive ourselves. We don't want to do that. And verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Oh, thank God he's faithful. You say, but Tony, you don't know what I did. Moses was a murderer. The Lord forgave him. Look at Paul. Lord, forgive us today. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, top to bottom. Cleanse us. In Jesus' name, cleanse us. Let's drink together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can we express our gratitude to the Lord? Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your broken body. Thank you for your shed blood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. We're cleansed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your cleansing, Lord. Thank you for your cleansing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bless you. Bless you guys. Bless you guys.